So I'd like to begin uh, today on this mid-September afternoon by acknowledging that the Art Gallery of Peterborough is located on Treaty 20 Michisagig territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagig and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina, First, uh, Georgina Island First Nations. The Art Gallery of Peterborough respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We hope in this exhibition of reciprocity that we can do the same and work together. Today, we're gathered in a place of exchange to spend time with and think about Alice Tichere's Reciprocity, which is a non-linear survey exhibition spanning four decades of practice. This exhibition opened on July 8th and continues to reveal itself. It's my great pleasure as uh, I'm Finn Leach, I'm the curator here to continue to be with it. So you get to come and see it, but I get to come five days a week. It's really, really a pleasure. Um, multidisciplinary artist Elise Tichere has studied music, philosophy, visual poetry, visual arts, and printmaking in Belgium and France, and I think we see all of those disciplines here together. Since 1989, she has built an international career with over 30 solo exhibitions in France, Canada, Switzerland, Germany, and Australia. Known for her bold use of color and layered <coughs> transparencies interspersed with script-like line drawings, Tichere's paintings are noted for their holographic depth. Her works are held in many corporate, private, and public collections, and she currently works from her studio in Port Hope, Ontario. So we're very lucky to have her in the area. And today she's here with us to engage in a conversation about this work. So, I'm going to turn this, the air over to you, um, and uh, and we'll just we'll just see what happens. Thank you, Finn, for You're the so introduction. I really appreciate it. Can I, can you all hear me? Please. Yes. Thank you. Well, welcome, welcome. Thank you for all for coming this way. Um, I was told that it's beautiful outside, and um, yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, and it's a great honor to welcome you here, and it's a great honor to be so welcome, feeling, uh, I feel so welcomed mm -hmm. here for this very unique experience that you have offered me uh, to explore mm -hmm. and to discover and to, and I unfold with it as well, even mm -hmm. more so every time I come here. So I haven't stopped working. No. <laughs> and there is so much more to be dealt with, which is so exciting. But what I would like to focus on today is to present um, in words a journey that, yes, for decades, that we discovered quite by chance because yeah. when we were selecting the work, I said, Finn, wait a second, wait a second, 1983, oh, time has flown by, right? Yeah. And then I hadn't quite finished 2023, the pieces, yeah. so let's embrace that. And... Um, but this exhibition really allows me to return back to the very source of what on earth happened. So, the quote that sticks with me and has is, ever since I learned to talk, I got to appreciate um, that every day is a new reading space. Every day is a new reading space. So I'm learning to read every day. Every day is a big, wide open book, a double page, which has a lot of meaning in my life. Um, growing up with a mother musician, I was sitting next to her as she is reading dots on lines. And for me, that's the perfect introduction to pure abstraction that carries a code and you learn a language. And from there, well, growing up in the environment uh, of the European communities in Belgium, and well, mainly in Belgium that is the case, um, I was exposed to four, between four and six languages right away. 
So everything was music. In the child mind, you don't make a difference. You don't make compartments. Everything is sound, music. And I somehow, that stuck with me, the, the sound of a language to which you can add intonations. I can give you the French accent, or I can give you the Dutch. Huh? This is all the, muscular, the muscles of my tongues. Mm. And the same applies into leaving traces behind. What am I drawn to? Drawing, drawn to. So for me, the core understanding of a visual language is me facing the traces that were composed and me trying to read, understand, then transfer, and then of course in the piano playing would be the dots come through my being and then I play the sounds. Mm. And then that creates the resonance. So the form of resonance is really what ripples through space. And that is where my work begins. Mm. So I'm learning how to read these ripples that are spreading in that space. So during my art education years, which are still ongoing, but the formal at school, you know, college, university, Beaux-Arts, Ecole des Beaux-Arts, that was in France, I was exposed to um, Printmaking, this is what I majored in. So that involves making a mark on a surface, pressing it down, printing it down. So there's a whole technique involved. The other thing is letterpress, words, letters that are placed in spatial configurations so that they are legible. So all this is part of the education on how to address a blank space. Mm learning how to read, the intervals, the progression of marks that create content. So I can go on and on like that, but I started to dissect text books. I literally took books apart, poetry mainly, that addressed how do I shape the gesture of my voice mm. via the language of drawing. And so this would be the middle table here, 1983, where I'm Literally, in conversation, the reciprocity takes place between the content of the book and my response. So this book was called the La Moitié du Geste, means the half part of a gesture. Mm -hmm. So we, I start to dance along. It becomes a, a mutual conversation. And then studying uh, the dissemination, you know, the, of course, uh, the famous one would be Jacques Derrida in this case, but other philosophers, Roland Barthes in France, that would be talking about the pleasures of the text, where you can literally examine on how the text has its own body that comes to life, depending on the angles that you start to look at them. And that would be the table over there, you'll see the same text with various interpretations mm. or aspects focusing on particular points, and it creates a different drawing. So it's really looking beyond your regular linear reading, but you go beyond and start to dissect or examine the traces that shape that content. Mm. So that you, you know, this is what we do. We face dots and lines, and then we somehow find meaning in things. And this is really at the base of everything, right? Mm -hmm. So we learn how to read. Do I understand correctly what you're saying to me is really, so I'm standing under the understood. There's a whole play of <laughs> words. So it's me, them in French. It's beautiful because you have je, j'ai, apostrophe, e. You can dissect those words. So it's me, them. It's the relationship mm. with all the languages and with the traces. Mm. So I'm leaving traces behind. And here we have a selection of 40 years of me leaving traces behind in response to something that triggered my interest, right? So it's all about composition and staying in line with what I'm told. The piece is starting to talk, the medium is starting to talk. Mm. It's a form of collaboration of all sorts. So, 
The early works show the dissemination, the undoing to discover the typography, the topography of the book unfolded. It's a map, it's a navigation system, and we all develop our own sense of our own GPS, really. <laughs> you know, how do I navigate through that? And we turn the pages, there is this lovely gesture. And then when we undo a map or a newspaper, we have all this corporality, you know, this, this gesture. So all this is part of the drawing. So just like speaking more than one language, each medium has its own vocabulary. And I think we're exposed to that, the multimedia aspect. Mm. We're going from uh, painting to drawing to yeah. offset to etching. You know, so video, it, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then uh, and then typesetting, yep. right, and uh, and different materials, canvas. So this all summarizes quite a bit. But what's at the core of it all? We all start. I mean, I know I always start with either a blank page, a blank double page. Mm -hmm. I love that. Some, it's really good to leave one blank, mm. a blank canvas. Mm and then watch the thing unfold in front of me. Mm. And I do a little bit of this and I do a little bit of that, right? <laughs> but it's all in a preparation to raise the focal points, mm. right? Yeah. So it's text painting, text painting. I like to put these things together. So making marks with whatever leaves a mark behind has its own language, its own intonation as well. Yeah. You yeah, know. I'm sort of struck by um, what you were speaking about uh, in terms of the, the musculature of the different sort of articulations or accents or, um, yeah, different languages, really. Uh, and also the, the huge variety in the physical um, processes that you in your studio are engaging with. Um, and sort of thinking about, like it, it was, it, it struck me just as I was sitting here that you've got a number of different, perhaps accents or vernaculars of these lines and dots. And they're coming through in these different sort of musculatures. Well, this is where I give myself permission. Yeah. And this is the sense of creativity that I apply. Hey, why not try this? Why not? It's a form yeah. of experimentation. So I basically, I go beyond the, the borders and bring them all together. So it's a form of a fusion, mm. you know? So I mix, uh, the, I, I jump out of the line to create constellations. You mm. know, you just throw everything up and then it falls down uh, like a constellation. And then you leave, uh, you know, you, you see what works, what not, mm. so it's a balancing act all the time. And uh, so, and then of course, you know, as I play with transparencies as well, the layering comes with the techniques that I have borrowed from, from the serigraphs. You know, the text is done unwritten, that's a process that takes 30 mylar pieces and then you create all these images mm. together uh, that uh, then transposes into painting, which is, you know, the famous uh, quote from Rembrandt is the secret lies in the washes mm. and the layers and the glazes, mm. you know. You get these holographic movements in there, you know, the motion. Every, for me, everything wants to be in motion. So mm. it, it's, it's energy in motion, really. Mm. So that gets materialized in some form, Yeah, you know. I, I'm thinking about um, sort of these very early works where you're inverting in a way the, the um, way that we perceive space and focusing on that sort of emptiness that is so full, right? And drawing, mm -hmm. drawing these lines to bring forward um, attention to the spaces that are between the words and then removing the words themselves. And this is, you know, one of those early pieces that we see sort of continuing to be articulated, but in very different ways mm -hmm. throughout your practice. Yeah. So um, thinking about this, this process that you do in the paintings where you're, and the newer work too, where you're using transparency and layers, I, I think that there may be something connected between this interest in empty space and an interest in transparent layers. 
Is that something? <laughs> That's it. And I, I, I'm liking the juxtaposition because it is really looking beyond the visible. Yeah. And then, so when you have a text, next time you go to sleep mm. and you want to read that last page of the book and you're starting to really feel like you're going into another world, pay attention to what happens to the text. It goes blurry and then you see the spaces in between. Mm -hmm. And without those spaces in between, the text wouldn't be alive. Yeah. But for me also, it, it became the aperture. Mm. This is where I find my voice. It's so I, I dive, I, I get nurtured by the content of the text, which was well composed, well written, and the, and, and the you know, it fills me. And then, uh, then I erase everything and I dive into that empty space and uh, allow the, my own content to come to be. Mm. And it takes time. So it's, it's really, it's, it's a great gateway. It's yeah. a, you know, so it's a portal. For me, a text is a portal. Yeah. So I can go into other spaces and we all have our own ways of reading. Yeah. And that, that is what I'm interested in. Yeah. Because this is where we, everybody has their own way of approaching a reading lesson. <laughs> there's the one, this is how you should read. But then there's also always that free reading space where everything can take, it's, it becomes a game. Mm. It becomes a, um, a stage, mm. you know, that to explore. Mm -hmm. The infinite, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The possibilities. And that is where I find my joy mm. and, and the, the, the material that I like to explore. Yeah. I'm thinking it might be useful for some of the, some of the folks in the room if you could speak a bit about, um, about your process in painting and some of the materials that you're using because um, for, I don't know, but maybe for some of you, it's the first time you've seen Elise's work um, or the first time you've, you've spoken about it. So yeah, if you could, if you could talk a bit about, about that. And I know there's some different examples in the room. Yeah, again, I, uh, the paintings, um, I really found that the acrylic medium is perfect for me mm. as I prepare, I approach painting like a printmaker. So the preparation time of the surface and all everything around me somehow has to be in place mm. because the, the, each gesture, uh, whether it's in preparation of the surface, is one short moment. That's why I work on, say, eight pieces at once, to, you know, to make my day productive. But um, most of the time is spent in the preparation, layer after layer after layer, to, to receive that depth in mm -hmm. the surface, which mm -hmm. is what I enjoy. Mm -hmm. And then after that, the surface starts to speak, and then little punctuation marks or um, something else is invited to come in, like mm. maybe a little arabesque or, or, you know, like I said, punctuation mark. It could be a mark. Mm -hmm. And uh, you will notice a lot of dots in my work. Well, this <laughs> is, well, what did I say at the beginning? This is the first thing I learned how to read. And depending on where it's placed, the power of the dot has a way to tell another story, mm. to attract our attention. And for me also, one of the powers that I really appreciate is when I have a very wide, almost monochromatic, even though the, with me it's layered, never, <laughs> um, but the overall has sort of this a minimalistic feel. Um, if I put a dot in there, it puts things into scale. Mm. So the enormity, it's like that could be the cell in the petri dish, mm. you know, and the environment around it. And so we have this very grounded sense mm. of relationship that we create with the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I like to be. I like to feel grounded, but at the mm -hmm. same time, I like to be all over the place. Mm -hmm. So I would say, of course, everything we do is an extension of who we are mm -hmm. at the present time. Mm. And uh, so I've used various materials going from, um, so the, the way I started with acrylic, I approached it like watercolor, aquarelle. Instead of using water to expand the undertones of the colors, I would use gel mediums, mm -hmm. you know? So this is how, and I've done with water as well. And, uh, and then I would 
as, as a printmaker does in, in an etching or in an aqua tint, I would create rough surfaces and then I would pour things over and things will settle in the crevices. Mm. You know, that would be the printmaker's approach. And then uh, in serigraphs, you use um, these big um, um, swipe squeegees. things, squeegees, you know, and I just do that in painting. Yeah. You know, and I have for almost four decades now, yes. <laughs> three at least, yeah. you know, because I only started painting in Canada. I didn't paint in France. Yeah. So this is where I was mostly a book artist, mm -hmm. right? And so the, my Canadian adventure really, and North American, I should say, because I navigated a lot between Toronto and New York in the early five days. Yeah, you don't really care about borders. <laughs> no, I don't. Exactly. I'm glad to be yeah, yeah. absent North America. Yeah, yeah. That's where I moved to. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then uh, occasionally there is this big mass of water that yeah. I have to surf in order to get to the other side, but yeah. there is a natural border. Yeah. So that one I'm willing yeah. to take. <laughs> But uh, it's really about combining the text aspect with the painted aspect because even a letter, you know, it's a shape that has been defined according to an alphabet that mm -hmm. everybody agrees on. Yeah. But when you study the origin of a letter, this first it starts with a squiggle and a doodle, you know, and then it takes shape. Yeah. Just like when you go from a squiggle and a doodle and you make a figure, yeah. you know, this is what, what we we would call figurative drawing, mm. for instance. Mm. But it all starts with a, with a doodle, with a dot, yeah. right? And yeah. then we, between A and B, the rest is the journey. And that's yeah. how I look at my work. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah, I think there's something that's, um, I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of like the gift of your work is this invitation to, um, you know, as you say, every day is, in, is a new reading space. And it, it strikes me that, you know, if, if we're starting from, which we're not, because we're starting from the abstraction, we're starting from the lines and the dots, but if we were to start from the written word, the written word often is presented as this thing that is full of definitives, right? There are these things that we've agreed on. There, one thing means one thing. Maybe it means a couple of things, but we can use context clues to decide which one it is. And there's a really interesting, um, there's a really interesting play, I think, between uh, your interest in moving language away from that definitive into something that's much more indefinite or, or flexible and malleable and you know being able to be reread or or perhaps productively misunderstood mm. you're playing with the way that text functions um, and the way that you use text all, all the time and I'm interested in that and I'm also interested in the in the process of your of your art making and how some of that has to be quite I don't know, quite thought out and quite sort of pre-planned, but then at the same time, and sorry for this, you know, rambling question, at the same time, you're working not in a straightforward way. This isn't a straightforward exhibition. This is, you know, intentionally not presented chronologically. These works are all placed in dialogue with each other where those natural connections present themselves. You're working in your studio, as you say, on maybe eight pieces at a time. And in that, I imagine that you're sort of responding to them as things go. I mean, you know your materials very well, but at the same time, there's, there's, a, there's a duration there. There's a, there's a dialogue there. There's an exchange there that's happening in your studio between yourself and your work. And oftentimes I have no clue where I'm going. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is the, this is the most difficult part, is to hang in there and wait until it reveals itself. Yeah. That's where the true work is. Because I could go home and say, oh my God, do you, I think I messed it up. And then the next morning, it's <laughs> like, see, every day is a new reading space. Yeah. I couldn't see it. Yeah. So the next day I can see it, yeah. at least parts of it. Mm. And I'm still learning to read my work mm. you know this is why I'm enjoying this uh, juxtaposition you know I mean here we have 1983 2023 yeah. 2023 1984 you know like and they're all communicating with one another yeah. in different medium and it just triggers so much more mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. this is the endlessness you know I can feel the undercurrent mm. that has guided me for some I mean it kept me in line mm 
offline, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to create my input-output circuitry, if you will. Yeah. Uh, but I'm also, my sense of curiosity makes me want to explore many other materials as well. So I'm starting to work with people, uh, you know, with ateliers, like the printmaking atelier, yeah. and uh, I'm still waiting for my collaborator here, <laughs> who has not appeared yet, but no. he may be a little later. Yes. Um, so the painted work, uh, all the canvases, they are my work in my studio. But I also like to go outside of my studio. Mm. So I, uh, I went to, I mean, even in the very early days, I went to um, offset printer mm. and printed these works that are there on the table from 1984. And then there are the serigraphs uh, along on the other side of the wall here called The Text is Still Unwritten. I collaborated with a printmaker atelier in Toronto. Mm. Uh, they were in operation until quite recently. And that's where, the, between people, the collaboration starts and the communication. We start to exchange words because we have to preset our thoughts mm. in order to be able to realize the, the materialize the, the end results. Of course, always full of surprises. And it's the latest adventure that I had is, is this piece here, which is called Mobile Memory. And that is a vision that I've had for years uh, so this is a composition that I came up with. Well, I started writing it in 1984, mm. and then it became this configuration in 2009, and it's been performed about 10 times by now, not just by me, but by others as well. Yes. And it comes with a structural instructions or guidelines, should I say, yeah. but there's really room for a lot of interpretation. And one thing that's very important to me here is where I used... The, do you remember Quark Express? Yes, okay. of course. I trained so I on use that. that as a tame, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As, I use that as a painting tool. Mm. So instead of using linear writing, which mm. is how I wrote the notes, yeah. uh, the notes I said notes. Uh, that's good because these are all notes. Yeah. And some are letters, some are words, some are literally musical notes that have found, you know, got inter intertwined in this whole thing. And then the layering aspect. So I, I started to have these spatial compositions, yeah. but they're with letters. And you can read it, but we read it a non-linear, just like this exhibition is built up. Mm -hmm. You go from here, okay, you know, non-chronological. Mm -hmm. In this type of reading, it, I'd say it's a galactic form of reading. It's yeah. like you're looking into the stars, you connect the dots, and you find the, whatever is meant to come yeah. together, right? So um, here, uh, so the the words become painted or drawn, or but they are still printed yeah. on the double page. But because of, uh, so when I was looking for how can I approach this, knowing that I'm going to do a site-specific installation for this exhibition here, I was searching around, who can help me? Who can help me? Yes. And in comes Dion Carlo, yeah. who had met just six months before in my studio. And I knew something was special about him, but I did not know that we were going to work together. Mm -hmm. But he offered me, when I was in my searching mode, he said, I can work with that, and I'm mm. very good at it. I said, mm -hmm. okay, let's work at it. Mm -hmm. And so because of his expertise, we worked together really well, mm. and he was able to you know, shape this open book, which is a very important uh, shape in my life, and there's more to come. Mm. Uh, but we transferred my composition that was on paper and framed and with the crease and uh, in, onto these acrylic sheets, yeah. which allow me to explore the translucency of the text and always the, you know, like in the parchment paper, the old books you see through yeah. the pages because yeah. there's always more than the surface, right? Yeah. And then also you may have noticed the edge, some of them have colored acrylic sheets and they have a way to capture light. So yes. you think there's a battery in there. No, it's just the way it catches the light. And that is where it brings, comes closer together with my painted, mm -hmm. my canvas work, mm -hmm. you know, because this mm -hmm. is, well, color catches light, mm -hmm. right? So it's, that's where it kind of brought, brought everything together. So this is sort of the, you know, the, the key piece for this exhibition that I've really, I'm very, uh, you know, grateful that it came true. 
and like I said, Dion Carlo is not here. <laughs> and I insist that he's working elsewhere. He tried to yeah. free himself, but he is here in spirit. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you also see, when you're looking at this piece, the tremendous amount of effort the gallery has made in um, trying to get people to not physically engage with it. <laughs> it, is, it is something that, um, I mean, I'm always struck by, by uh, the body's reaction to things that it, that it is generally invited to touch, right? And um, paintings don't necessarily fall into that category, but books do. And so here we've got this, uh, this sculpture that to, to us very clearly reads as a sculpture that you, you shouldn't touch. <laughs> but we just witnessed the body's drive to want to flip through and fold these pages and and see what's next, right? Isn't and try that to read it Isn't and try to fabulous? read it. Yeah, yes. it's really fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's so interesting to see that. I wonder. I'm wondering if if you could speak a little bit about um, about the process as an artist of seeing new work out of the studio because, I mean, in here we've really got one major piece that is engaging with the public for the first time and frankly it's one that is engaging with the public in a very intense kind of way and maybe a new way for you. Um, and it's always the case, and we've spoken about this multiple times, it seems to always be the case that um, as much as the curator or the critic or the artist can sort of pre-plan what the, what the content of the exhibition is, we're continuing to learn mm -hmm. as we, as we see people walk through Absolutely. the space and, and things like that. So yeah. I'm wondering if you could share a bit of, of that experience with the audience. Welcome to the unknown. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Mm. I love it because I get to appreciate the power of mm. something that has really taken over my life. <laughs> the power of the book. I yeah. love books and I yeah. love them when they're at that huge scale. And for me, it's an invitation to actually create something where you literally, you know, the whole yeah. body, more to come, I can, I can assure you, <laughs> but literally it becomes a physical a dance. Maybe yeah. that becomes a performance piece, but yeah. really I want, I'm thinking of two things, you know, it's really about creating one where the, the public, the audience or the public or the viewer is allowed to touch. Yeah. I want that because this is almost like, okay, I get it for this they one. They want it too. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And, but there's the painting, the same thing, mm -hmm. you know, like um, a little anecdote. So that painting over there, it's called collaboration around the wall there. And this actually is, has carries a certain experience. Yes. So, uh, Maybe some of you know uh, this um, wonderful professor at Trent University, Jonathan Bordeaux, yeah. and he came to my studio with his students, cultural studies, three years in a row. Yeah. And for one visit, I had this painting at a very early stage where uh, some of it was already, I had left marks behind, traces behind, and the other one was really in the preparation mode. And I said, what, what a wonderful way to introduce students to a real studio visit. Mm. So I had these pastel crayons on a tray and I went to each of them here to take a color, make a mark. Mm. And there was hesitation. I said, oh, no, 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 no. Please, please do, you know. So there is this invitation. Mm. And everybody had a ball, mm. you know. This is a, and, and that is what this, it's a true collaboration. So I'm thinking that is actually a workshop, worth a workshop. Yeah. You know, maybe we need to talk. Maybe we need to but talk. But this is, this is a lot of fun, you know, yeah. the interaction between, like the unexpected, because I don't know what mark you, for instance, are going to make, or you, or you, or you, you know. This is, everybody has their own sense of mm. marking. And why not? Mm -hmm. You know, so this is this is where the, the spectrum widens mm -hmm. out. You know, so mm -hmm. this is a bigger panorama sure. of what it means yeah. to create something. Yeah. And so this, yes, it is the first time it is uh, exhibited. Yeah. I mean, this is an experiment. Yep. And I love that part. Yep. That aspect is very instructive to me. Yes. And it, like I said, it puts um, three dots the ellipsis, right? Mm. The three dot, it moves on 
right? It's yeah. to be continued, yeah. as we were. You know, <laughs> you see that little bracket, mm -hmm. talk about leaving traces behind, open bracket, three dots, close, close. to be continued. Mm. So we've got works in here uh, that are using transparency. So there are things in here or mediums in here that allow light to pass through. There's also mediums in here that capture the light, which you were speaking about a bit. Like it's, it's so true, these, uh, these acrylic pieces, especially the ones that have color, they're just, they're just glowing. And in fact, though we can't see it right now, there are other mediums in this room that capture, hold, and then glow Indeed. that light. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about that process for you, or luminosity perhaps in your work. Well, the luminosity is achieved via layering, mm. but then of course the acrylic medium has so much to offer, mm. and I'm always you know, checking things out, go to the toy store, what, what else did they come up with, yeah. right? And so I found the phosphorescent paint some 10, Yeah, just to be clear, there, there are some paintings in here that glow using phosphorescent. Indeed, yes. and uh, so if we were to turn off the lights, the right side will continue to glow. And so why would I do that? For the very simple reason that I also, you know about the illuminations in the old books. Yes. You know, highly decorated and there's gold and depending on how the light captures it. But though that's sort of embracing the, the beauty of the wordless. It's not decoration, it's more powerful than that. And they're called illuminations. Why? Because they were scriptures of mm. spiritual nature, for instance, or, or it was a, a way of approaching things mm. for a long period of time. And uh, I thought with phosphorescence, I can actually accent that. It became my tool of expression to use that paint to emphasize on the space between my marks, because mm. it gets reversed. Mm. Right? It's like a negative, positive uh, photograph, mm. and that's what I achieved. So mm. we have that painting is also glowing, yeah. um, and, and this one. So I have a whole series, and actually I'm working on a lot more right now. Um, so yeah, this is, this is how, where the, the medium or the pigment has its own power mm -hmm. that I like to give it voice. Mm -hmm. You know, it fits within, it, 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 it helps me to express what I'm finding, you know, mm -hmm. what, what I would like to say mm -hmm. without words. Mm -hmm. I'm going to circle back because I meant to uh, invite you to talk a little bit more about this input output, this, uh, this connectivity and this exchange thing because I was re-watching um, some of your lunch and learns with the Eno Gallery that uh, during, during the pandemic, um, Elise uh, and the Eno Gallery presented a, a couple of like, you know, hour long dialogues all in this, you know, weird space of, of, the, of the internet room. <laughs> yes. But uh, in one of them, you were speaking about this, this shift that you felt in your work in 2018 or 19. Um, and yeah, I would invite you to talk a little bit more about that. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I've experienced so many shifts. Yes. But at the same time, uh, so one shift that is quite visible here yeah. is for the longest I was using this technique in the paintings where I would approach um, one material, then there was water involved, and then the the material has changed recipe yes. and suddenly it became aquaphobic. So the whole layering, imagine a croissant, the pastry of a croissant. One time I entered my studio and I had this bag of water. My, my paintings were separated, oh. you know? So this is where it was the completion of one wow. way of using the material. So yeah. the material decides as well. So then yeah. I move on and then I explore instead of the glossy part, it would be the uh, frosty finish. Mm. And I say during the pandemic, the, the one that you were watching, I had two shows during lockdown time, lockdown one, lockdown two. Yeah. And I had come across a painting from uh, 1992 that was auctioned off in England actually. <laughs> and I said, oh, I like that. And I used the fluorescent pink mm. in those days too. 
and uh, it had the frosty finish. Mm. And I said, mm, let ah. me explore that because I couldn't continue the work the way I, what I had done previously. Yep. I got to move on, right? Yep. And so then I went back to the, the, this more the sound wave aspect mm. and it, it kind of left playing with, with the texture mm -hmm. and all that, the transparency, which is now also incorporated in mm -hmm. that painting, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. that line mm -hmm. in the back there carries that one on as well. Mm -hmm. That painting in particular, if I may draw attention after when, when we can all walk around, also has a material that they don't make anymore because the pigment is not available right. anymore. But from one side, it shines one color, and then from the other side, it shines another color. So this is where, you know, the pieces become unique, mm -hmm. right? They all mm -hmm. have their own form of resonance, mm -hmm. of uniqueness, because it is the one-of-a-kind show, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so this is where the multifaceted aspects of, of the materials come in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but one thing that I felt I, earlier, I said about motion, I, I like everything moving. The, the video is, yes. is, is actually a, a sculpture from an installation piece yeah. that I started to play around and I took photos and then I used the Photoshop uh, medium to paint. Yeah. And it brought me similar colors of what I do with a, acrylic paint. Yeah. So that's yeah. where it all went hand in hand again, yeah. you know. So this is the first time I actually dare to move into the video aspect. <laughs> More to come, you know. And that one it's has so much light work in it as well, right? You're using shadow and different yes. colored lights and all, yeah. all sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. Um, perhaps in the spirit of, of openness and finding new ways to read things, we can invite questions from the floor if anybody is. If anybody is. Oh, okay, great, Kelly. Well, first of all, I think you and I, we need to collaborate <laughs> because I like the, the, the light idea, you know, that's, that's definitely. Well, uh, uh, after collecting all the little, you know, say some people collect words in a book, I collect materials, I'd like to use this. Oh, this may come in handy one time. And this is how these pages came to be. I said, ah, I know exactly what to do. You know, that's how it happened. And this is basically how it works. It's like, it feels like by happenstance, chance, serendipity, but I'm, I'm ready. You know, mm -hmm. I always, that's why my studio is full of stuff. I don't know when I'm going to use it, but it'll come in handy sometime. Or it'll surprise me, you know, if something falls, oh, I hadn't thought of that one, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but in a nutshell, it really is everything under the kitchen sink. I can't really plan. I, I like to be in the now. And then I, I like to hear the past experiences and the possibilities from how it could be. Mm. That's kind of the internal dialogue that I have. Yeah, and everything else finds its spots, dots, <laughs> meanings, you know. Yeah. I want to add, it just, I mean, because of my job, I'm always thinking about 
uh, the ways that things get installed and the plinths and where the um, screws are, like all of those kinds of all of those kinds of things. And I think, in part, your question sort of pulls forward this this play between the room or the or the light, the tone of the light, how much intensity there is, and um, and those kinds of things. And I know that we definitely felt a resonance between the double page and the physicality of this room. There are so many yes. double pages yes. quietly presenting themselves in Absolutely. this room. But I think one thing that we um, weren't certain was going to present itself, and I, I'm gonna I'll come back to that in a sec, one of the things that we had to pre-plan was um, how we were going to present these works on paper. And so there was a lot of, a lot of thought put into uh, the physicality of the plinths and, and also how to um, protect them, because we know, we know people are handsy and we know paper is uh, this thing that paper is, is an invitation. vulnerable and uh, has a memory and just loves to hold um, yes. just whatever has happened to it uh, yes. in, its, in its surface. Um, so there was a lot of thought that went into how we were going to protect these things. And I would assume these are quite unique plinths. Like I've never seen plinths presented quite like this. And something that we weren't so sure about, or that we didn't know was going to happen, is how the light was going to interact with the plinths. That's a good point. So let's talk a little bit about so we're that. Talk, yeah, so that's a very good point. And uh, a discovery as we were yes. installing. So the light, uh, painting with light. Uh, so we, the, the covers, acrylic sheet covers, they were specially made according to the size of my work. And um, your installer, Paul, Paul, built these fantastic boxes. And uh, the acrylic sheets were actually manufactured in the same workshop where we had these pages yes. sculpted. Yes. And uh, in, because of the extent, the length of the table, we couldn't have a flat surface. So making it uh, bend like this, and they're, they're just bent, they're not uh, welded or, or glued. Just the, the, the glue is just on the edge, but it solidifies the surface. Now the challenge is, we had everything in place, and then comes the lighting, painting mm -hmm. with light. So the room told us where to place the boxes because we also had limited lights. That's yeah. another thing. But the beauty yeah. is limit. we do with what we have. That's right. And we figured out a way to paint with light. And there you have the reflection. We use that bend to emphasize the, the main artery or the, the, the channel of the work. And then suddenly I look at that, it's perfect, perfect. Look at that, we have mm -hmm. it in the spine of each double page. So it reflects the idea, the, the bodily aspect of a double page yeah. and the installation. So everything becomes, you know, we have the spine and the other sides, mm -hmm. right? The two wings or whichever way you want to expo uh, uh, describe these things. But that is an added surprise to this exhibition as well. Yes. Absolutely. Site specific. Yes. Site, site specific. Yes. Yeah. You know. So these works is the first time they're being shown in Canada, by the way. They came out of my archives. So this is a treat for me as well. Oh, Thank it's you. a treat for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. <laughs> and so I guess I'm wondering, to sort of move from the retrospective to look to the future, like, what do you see as the sort of ethical or philosophical stakes of maintaining a relationship with textuality in print today? Mm. It's a must to keep it. Mm -hmm. It's very important to learn how to read the old way, actually the infinite way. Mm -hmm. There is always that. But then there is also, I think we, we, we need to discern the space where we stick to something, focus, learn how to draw, how to apply things properly, and then the, from the space where we give ourselves permission. And I think the foundation is, has to be solid in order to 
take the right permission for me. And everybody finds their own way. There is no one way, you know. Uh, I find it's really important to understand the collective approach of things and then the, juxtaposing with individual interpretation, but um, not, not fixate on one, to me. That's where the breathing space comes in. If, I hope that answers your question. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, I'm going back to the start. I used to teach kids art. And you know, when you were with your mother looking at the notes, um, were you intrigued straight away? Or mm -hmm. did you have to be quiet and introverted? Or uh, and did your mum take up that, um, um, that interest for you and, and give you dialogue and help you along with it? Thank you for that question. Um, my mother, I think her life was about music. Uh, it is where I saw my mother in, 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 in her most fulfilled way of being. Um, it is the first language that I learned from her. I think that is the vehicle where she expressed her love. She was not the mother that would have you know, like very maternal. She was a free spirit. Music was her vehicle. And it's via that that she expressed her love. Mm. And so her love of wanting to us to learn music, uh, my siblings and me, and, uh, and it was very rigorous. So I had um, very, uh, you know, musical theory, um, Courses and and uh, she was uh, she taught me piano and and you know discipline. It's a form of discipline that I learned via that vehicle, and uh, I think that's the only way I know about discipline. You know, if I didn't do it right, come on, do it right. I mean, it's like a dancer learns from a very strict teacher to do the arabesque, you know, and do the you know, the pirouette. You know, it has to. It's a it's a strict training that makes you good. Mm. And that's, that's what I'm applying in my work. That's mm. really the resonance of it is um, learning how to read those jumping dots and transferring it into whatever melody is given to me in the, in the, on the score, mm. you know? So, and that same thing applies in language and, you know, not to end up pronounce it properly, right? So that, uh, you know, in English you pronounce it in a certain way, in French in a certain way, mm -hmm. in German in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And in my own writing, I actually mixed everything together and the sound of it. You know, the vowels have sound. So um, for children, that's a very natural thing to do. You know, I've taught children as well, especially when my children's friends came over birthday parties. I was standing high up and they're all on the floor in my studio and everybody was drawing and it was, but they, the freedom is absolutely amazing. Mm. And that's what I treasure. So yeah, uh, you feeling about, uh, you know, teaching children. It has, uh, I get so much out of teaching to children mm. because they teach me, Yeah, you know, don't get boxed in, don't get brainwashed, you know? So they keep me fresh. <laughs> yeah. And something else you said as well about you know, for words to have meaning, they have to have spaces in between. And with music, the, the, the hearing, the vocal, yeah. they have to have spaces in between to, have to be music. Mm. It would just be one long drone. Yes, and did, you know, and did you know, did you know that the sounds we can't hear are the colors we see? There is an interrelation between the sound and the color. Everything has vibration. Everything has frequency. And this, oh. now we're talking energy. But this is where, you know, when you see a rainbow, stop, look at it. That's nature resounding, you know, the light reflection, and you see the rainbow, you know. I don't want to take a lot of time, but the um, yellow and blue, apparently the cones and the rods and cones and the eyes are the most extreme there, and huh. the bees are on the same wavelength, and they get, go to blue and yellow. Huh. Thank you, thank you. I happen to be a beekeeper, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> very good. That, there you go, frequency, yeah. resonance, yeah. Yeah. for sure, for yeah. sure. And every sound has a configuration also, right? Yeah. I mean, this is it's fascinating how everything is 
in reciprocity mm. of everything that is, right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to stop in a minute, but the way you said they all interacted with each other and you knew, if, you, if we listen to our intuitive, intuition, we... Something happened, and this is the gift, the present, yeah. the present, the now, that's teaching me, at least you were on to something 40 years mm -hmm. ago, and learn from that, because... There are many more years, I, you know, there's more work to be done, but this is where the gratitude comes in. Yeah. You know, it's like, wow, I get to appreciate where I was because I didn't always see that, but I just went for it. And that's, I feel grateful, mm. you know, to be exposed to this. So thank you for this golden opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, you know, <laughs> thank you, space. Yeah, thank you, you know? space. I love this room. Um, just sort of picking up from the, this, this idea of discipline and practice in that, I've, in like in ballet, right? There's this striving to get it right and there's a right way to do something. And then at a certain point you get past that, right? And you're able to um, sort of leave that right way behind, even though that right way is somewhere in your body. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you can, if you can speak a bit about that. That's when your personal touch comes in, yeah. literally, because the right way is a practice, yeah. but then, you know, all great musicians will add their own sense of interpretation, mm -hmm. yeah. their own being, yeah. really. It becomes a, um, an extension yeah. of their state of being, yeah. and that's how I've and that's a state that's very hard to achieve. Yeah, when do you think you, how do you think you get there? <laughs> because I no think- No clue. Yeah, okay, great. Um, because there, there has to be some sort of, um, there's a permission, right? But, uh, but there also, in order to get to that point, there must be some sort of comfort level or some sort of um, something that allows that intuition to speak louder. To me, I would say it's a sense of alignment. Okay. Uh, it's a, it, it, where all the elements sort of find their balance within the movement. It's a yeah. harmony. Yeah. It's more a, hum, a harmony mm. issue rather than the right issue. Yeah. Right? For me, yeah. it's the harmony. It makes sense. It gels. Yeah. I, yeah. Here we have a double yeah. entire gels in painting, you know? But it just starts to make sense. Mm -hmm. It finds its own sense of being. Mm -hmm. That's where I think you mentioned the word surpassing yeah. the practice aspect. Yeah. But it becomes its own. So yeah. it's time to let go. Yeah. It's like the bubble that it touched itself and it's starting to yeah. float and do its own thing. And similarly yeah. to the words or to the music, you need these, these moments of rest or these spaces in between. Yes, and, and those moments of pause silence is louder than words. That's mm. part of my writing, but it's, I'm not the first one to say so, but I really get to appreciate the moment of pause mm. because the moment of pause is where I start to breathe and I start to listen within. We talked input, output. Yes. There's a lot of listening within, but then how do I apply it to out there? Yeah. So as within, out there, okay, it's part famous saying, but again, it's broader than that. I don't want to sound too simple, you know? So yes. it's really about exploring mm -hmm. um, awareness. Uh, how now can I be is mm -hmm. the, the core. And then en route pour de nouvelles aventures, you know? Mm -hmm. It's really, um, yeah, the sense of exploration, mm -hmm. adventure, journey, you know, with all twists and turns, hopefully not too many banana peels on the road. <laughs> But that's when we catch ourselves. I mean, up, yeah, right? maybe there's something I mean, useful in, a, in the occasional it's a banana peel. Yes. Great dance move. Yes. Great dance move. Yes. There you go. The choreography <laughs> of nature. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm open to another question if there is one, and uh, and if not, what we could do is um, is just sort of shift ourselves into the next phase of this conversation where we get to take our bodies up and stretch a little bit and look around, look a little bit more closely. Um, I'll work to get the, the chairs away. And I think at some point uh, we may as well also uh, take a moment where everybody knows it's gonna happen to turn off the lights. Sure. Yeah? I would like to thank everyone for listening. Yeah. Thank you so much for your undivided attention and for coming this way. Much, much appreciated. <laughs> Thank you.
Great. And thank you, Finn, mm. for a beautiful conversation. Thank you. And Celeste and, and the whole team uh, of the Art Gallery of Peterborough for receiving me with such open arms. We got nice people here. Thanks, Elise.